Hi, my name's Josh. I'm from the Lismore Symphony Orchestra. You may recognise our next guest as the tuba player in the orchestra. He brings to us his one-man story, Tuba Singularity. My colleague, my friend, Lismore Symphony presents James Harvey. Well, hello. I'm James Harvey. I'm the tubist with the Lismore Symphony Orchestra. And normally, we'd have an orchestra here. But in COVID times, strange things happen. And today, I'm here to present a program called Tuba Singularity to tell you a little bit about the instrument that I love so well. Now, as orchestras go, here's a big one. This is the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra back in 2013 with a program that they did called Symphony in a Day. They invited accomplished musicians to send in their resumes to see if they might get selected to play with the Melbourne Symphony in Town Hall. Now, as I had always answered the question when anyone asked me, would you ever play in an orchestra again after leaving the United States and not playing for 24 years? I said, well, yeah, 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 sure. If there was a it was a good program and an afternoon rehearsal and evening concert. Yeah, sure, I'd be there, rather flippantly, as I do. But then I hear on the ABC Classic FM this offer to play in the Melbourne Symphony. So I had to send in my resume, and lo and behold, I ended up in this gigantic orchestra. You can see the tubas. There are three of us in this particular orchestra of 187, and I'm in the middle back there. And. Uh, it was an epiphonic experience. I wasn't the same person when I left as the one who went in and was really wondering, what should I do with this tuba now that I've re-entered symphonic music? As it happened, very soon, I got approached by the Lismore Symphony to come play with them in the Bangalore Music Festival. And here is our Lismore Symphony Orchestra. Much more practical, much more understandable orchestra than 187 musicians, but still that tremendous symphonic sound. And there I am again in the back in front of the timpani next to the double basses and the cellos and my friends the bassoons, and we create that bass sound, that thing that everyone really loves and it supports and holds up the whole harmonic structure of our symphonic music. So one of the things I want to do today is to take you on a little journey to talk about where this comes from, where this sound comes from, where this instrument, how this instrument appeared, because we're actually the youngest instrument in the orchestra. We're the last ones to be accepted into the ensemble for its sound and for its presence and for what it could do in promoting the kind of music that was being generated in the 18th century, 19th century, and into the 20th century. But before I get to that part of the story, I want to talk a little bit about where does this come from? Where does music come from? We don't know. We really don't know. But we know it is at the origins of consciousness, of human consciousness. And part of it is about imitation. And an imitating of sounds, like we would do if we call back to a bird or moo back to a cow or whatever touches our fancy in playing with sound, or calling to each other over distances, there is with bass sound the notion that, well, it takes a lot of energy to have bass sound. And here's some examples of the natural world of bass sound. Thunder. Thunder is profound. It shocks and awes when it appears. It really, really gets our attention. And it's foundational and fundamental. Then there's ocean surf. This is a very famous woodcut painting from Japan, the Great Wave. If you go down to the beach and you listen very carefully, you'll hear that there's a profound drone, deep bass sound is sounding across the landscape. If you come back into the hinterland two or three kilometers, it gets even louder. And at night, it's quite profound, the very deep drone of the entire coastline as waves come in. And then, of course, there are beasts that bellow. And uh, they get our attention, too, in early humanity. And we took that information with us as we went forward in imitating sounds and making uh, music with it, whatever music is. Now, 
I want to first start with the primal, archetypal instrument of Australia, of Aboriginal Australia, and that is the didgeridoo. It's the didgeridoo that brought me here to Australia. I thought I was coming for a three-week holiday to find a didgeridoo maybe in Sydney, have a little holiday, which is a bit unusual for an American to actually leave the country, and then go back home to my teaching job at the University of Colorado and continue with my life. However, I ended up being here for three months, going on a magical adventure that eventually landed me into Arnhem Land. And in coming into Arnhem Land, I was gifted with this didgeridoo. This is back in 1988. This particular instrument, you see, doesn't have any decorations on it. It was one, at one time a ceremonial instrument. And it's a blank canvas right now. Um, in traditional ways, it would be all painted up with design, clan designs and different uh, painting to be used in ceremony. And then it's washed off. And quite often, that's buried later until it's used. So anyway, I was presented with this didgeridoo, and life was, again, like with the Melbourne Symphony, not quite the same. I went back to America, but then I had to come back again to prove that this first encounter was just, didn't really mean anything. I got a didgeridoo, so what? It sounds like a Stradivarius, so what? It doesn't happen very often, but I just got in deeper. And produced this album called Track to Bumbliwa, which is about that adventure. And you can see the didgeridoo there on the cover. So let me just play a little bit of the didgeridoo here for you. Its acoustic wave travels down the length of the tube, which is a tree that has been hollowed out by ants and termites. And all cleared out and then cut to length. How that works, I don't understand with my Aboriginal associates. They can tune didgeridoos by sight and ear and come right on to pitches. This particular instrument is basically pitched in D flat, uh, which is a very interesting key for it to be in, one of my favorites. And if you look down the didgeridoo, you see it's not a clear cylindrical kind of bore and very clear. It's actually got all these ridges and gullies and it looks like a landscape inside. And it sounds rather like a landscape. <laughs> So yes, the didgeridoo, a very profound, very expressive instrument that belongs to the world's oldest indigenous culture. This has become a quite a popular instrument in recent times and is played in all kinds of ways. Um, I prefer to sound it and listen to the overtone series and the cycles and, and such uh, and not try and imitate any kind of aboriginal playing, though I have been in a number of corroborees and participated in them and have great respect for all of that. So the didgeridoo, a tube, a hollow tube, how does that make music? Well, this is a good example of how horns sound. This is the conch shell. And we have one here. The conch shell is the outer protective exoskeleton of a gastropod, a sea snail. It grows very large. There's all kinds of them. These instruments have been found around the world since ancient times. They're referred to in the Hindu Vedas. We find them in Tibet. They're in South America with the Incas. They're in the Pacific Islands, which is greatly identified with. But you find the conch all over the world back into antiquity. antiquity. And it is a very distinctive sound. I'll play it for you first and then explain a bit. Beautiful 
beautiful sound. And the way it's produced with wind, which is more importantly, our driving force, our motivating force for all these instruments is our breath, our wind. As you can see here with this slide, that the chamber of the inside of the shell gets gradually and gradually bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it comes out the end here. And in this slide, it's compared to the Fibonacci spiral, which is a mathematical concept about how a spiral is created from one to one to three to five to eight and spirals out. The conch is never a perfect Fibonacci spiral, but it's close enough. And it shows us the properties that are involved in creating sound with an instrument in that we are playing on what's called a fundamental tone, which is what we heard here. That I can vary by putting my hand deeper into the conch in order to um, change the length of the spiral. Now, that relates to the physics of sound, which was described for us originally 2,500 years ago by the Pythagoreans in taking a string and hearing the vibration of a string, then putting it in half and hearing half of it and then a third of it and a quarter of it. And they outline the notes of the modes and scales that we use down to this day. Now that's with a string. It happens, as with physics, that it also works with horns, with horns that get larger, particularly as they get uh, longer. So this principle has been used to produce music for a very long time. And for part of that time, we've had instruments such as this. Now the oldest instrument we have known of is a flute that comes from a cave that was made by Neanderthals. It's 40,000 years old. If you Google it, you can go hear it. It's hauntingly beautiful, this flute made from a, the wing bird of a swan, I think. Maybe it was a vulture, don't know, can't remember. Anyway, 40,000 years at least. And if we find it working at 40,000 years, it proceeds much further than that. Now here I have pictured the trumpets of Tutankhamun. In Tutankhamun's tomb, there was found two trumpets. These are from 1500 BC. One was brass and the other was silver with kind of a gold inlay on its bell. And there's a great deal of mythology about these trumpets. And again, if you Google it, you'll find some interesting stories about this being war trumpets and that nobody dares blow them. It was actually demonstrated on the BBC in 1939 and broadcast, and then we know what happened after that. So there's Tutankhamun's trumpet. Here in this slide, we're looking at other ancient horns. Horns have been used for a long time just as horns, cattle horns, but also here in the top corner there, you'll see what's called an oliphant. This is an elephant's tusk that was carved into a hunting horn. This particular one was a gift to Charlemagne back at the end of the late Dark Ages, early Middle Ages, and is a horn that was played and used by Charlemagne and is also part of the whole epic story of the Song of Roland in that mythology. Over to the left of it there is what's known as the lure. The lure was a brass instrument that was from the Vikings. And it seems that the Vikings are the people who actually figured out a mouthpiece, a place to be able to put that sound into the instrument. There was another instrument at that same time, a little bit later, called the Cernox, which is even stranger than the, than the lure. And these were both used in ceremonies and as instruments of intimidation and warfare. You blow the lures, you blow the cernax, and your enemies go, uh-oh, they're coming. And your guys go, oh yeah, we're coming. It gives us energy and makes them afraid was kind of the principle of it. Down the bottom corner here, we have what's known as radong. And radongs are very large brass trumpets from the tantric tradition in Buddhism in Tibet. And they're used in ceremonial music and they can be heard from miles away. And again, there's that big, beautiful, wonderful 
bellow that we are talking about with beasts. So, in coming in closer to the present, we have an instrument like this. This is a post horn. This particular post horn has a little engraving on the front of it, and it tells us that it's got heart and camera flugu, 1831 is when it was made, which is an important date we'll learn in a few minutes. But this is a brass version of the conch shell. It starts small, it gets bigger. And it's called the post horn because with these particular instrument and many others for hundreds of years were used to call out when the mail was arriving. The mail and postal work was the responsibility of governments. And this particular horn, and looking it up, was actually the instrument that was used on the stagecoach run between Italy and what is now Switzerland over the Gotthard Pass. And there's a very famous painting here uh, from Switzerland of the stagecoach trundling down the pass and sounding the horn, letting people know to get out of the way, chase the cows, and also that the mail's coming and packages are coming. Here's what the post horn sounds like. <laughs> Now, I'm not playing it like I would play a post horn if I was on the stage. It's kind of more for me a... Something that maybe Miles Davis might like, uh, this kind of instrument. And it's a historic thing because for hundreds of years, this was in people's lives. Kind of like the sounding uh, things we have on our iPhones that tell us we've got a message or a call or a WhatsApp session about to happen. Um, these were used for hunting. They were used for uh, the mail, as I was saying. It was ubiquitous in the society. So, coming again closer to the present, we come to the tuba. This wonderful instrument. Its basic length is 16 feet three meters, I don't know, and it has come upon the scene in 1835. The patent for the first bass tuba, a five-valve instrument, which is these things here, is 1835, four years after that post horn was made, and it changed everything. Because of the Industrial Revolution and the brass metal working and all that was going on in machine work, we are finally able to create a bass instrument, and in this case, a contrabass instrument, an instrument, a musical instrument that sounds at the same range as the contrabass string bass, by being able to add length to it. Each valve adds a certain amount of length, and by doing so, we can play chromatically. So it's a giant bugle, and as a bugle, without any hands, we can play a number of pitches, very clear, very in tune, and begin to have the possibility, with the adding of these tubes, of a chromatic scale. And with more valves, we can go even lower. There's the lowest open note on this instrument. It's a 32 foot C, the same as the big giant pipe in a concert organ or a church organ. That note is rich with all of the overtones above it. And it's into those overtones that everyone else in the orchestra fits into when the tuba is present. 
It provides a foundation and a base for everyone else to be in and be taken into those harmonics. And in that way, the tuba blends very well with every other instrument in our orchestra or in a jazz band or whatever you have. So I'll play for you a little bit of music. This was an uh, improvisation I did um, back in 1985. I went on an um, extended 10-day camping trip for creative artists. And the idea is that we would go out in the wilderness and create some art. <laughs> so what did I do? I brought a tuba. Um, that was an interesting little hike. And my, pra my praxis, my intention while I was out there in the wilderness, I would play in the morning at dawn, and I'd play in the evening at sunset, and I would improvise on the overtone series of the instrument and see what happened. These became recorded on, the, on site when I did it to take it back and prove that I'd done my thing, and was later played in recitals at the University of Colorado, and was known as Four Songs from Sweet William. I'm not going to play all four of them for you, but I'll play an excerpt which uh, is known as Oso Negro, uh, Black Bear, and um, has the spirit of the canyon and of the outdoors and of the wilderness and of this place that I love to play in and have been doing forever, going outside and finding acoustical spaces where it's resonant. And I'll just say in passing, this is what a concert hall is. A concert hall is a cave. A concert hall is a canyon. It's a place of resonance. It's a place, of, a space where sound can actually live and be generated. So, this is also Negro from Four Songs from Sweet William. So that's the giant bugle, no valves, making music, being expressive. It's wonderful. But then we got these things, these valves, these me mechanical adaption to the instrument. Before this, with trying to get bass instruments, bass wind instruments, the best we could do was shorten an instrument. So we had serpents that were made out of wood, and you'd pick up fingers like a recorder, and it would make it a little bit shorter, and you'd get different notes. 
But this is a completely different innovation in that rather than shortening the instrument, we lengthen it and we get to go deeper and deeper and deeper. Oh. And the usefulness of this in ensemble music and symphonic ensemble music is self-evident. But it wasn't immediately except to one person, Wagner. Wagner started writing his ring cycle in the 1840s. It took him 25, 30 years to write all four operas. Siegfried was in 1871 when it came along. And in Siegfried, we get huge tuba solos. Actually, through all the ring operas, there are tuba solos in this contrabass instrument that he introduced into the orchestra, along with other instruments that he innovated, the Wagner tuba, which is a cross between the French horn and the tuba, the contrabass trombone, a truly awesome instrument that plays in the same register as the contrabass tuba, the bass trumpet. But he specifically wanted a contrabass tuba, and he actually, we believe it was Vaclav Shervaini, and what is now the Czech Republic, who created the first contrabass tuba for the orchestra that was used in Wagner's ring. Now the tuba was personifying in the ring to a great deal the nemesis of Siegfried, the hero of the operas, Fafner, the dragon, a primal mm, thing that uh, needed something really big to show it off. And there's in the opera, at different points, references to Fafner. And when we get to Siegfried, the third opera in the series, we have solos in both the overture to the opera for the tuba, talking about Fafner instrumentally. And then in the second act, also a very long exposition by the contrabass tuba with only the timpani underneath it. And the tuba comes in and plays this expressive solo that goes on for 20 or 30 bars. I haven't counted them really, I probably should. Um, that tells us where we are in the story. That uh, Siegfried's entering this very dark, dank forest to meet up with the dragon Fafner and one of them isn't going to come out of the encounter, and the other will. So this is the opening scene to the second act, where we hear the fact that we're in a very dark, spooky forest, and there's something dangerous in there.
Yes, yeah, so there we have it. There's a dragon in the woods, and we're going to go meet him. And then you can see in this slide that I have here, here's Siegfried sounding his horn. Siegfried gets bored waiting for the dragon, nearly falls asleep in the forest and listens to a bird and tries to make a flute to play with the bird, gives that up, and he decides to sound his horn call, one of the most famous French horn solos in all of the literature. And of course, what does he do? He wakes up the dragon, right? He wakes up Fafner playing his horn, smart boy. And the Vog as the dragon wakes up at the end of the horn call, two tubas come in playing Wagner's theme, Fafner's theme, and the battle takes place. Pure genius, Wagner. I have a lot of time for that, man. So at that point, because of Wagner's use of the instrument in the ring and everyone hearing this, composers took it up with passion. And so all kinds of wonderful music started getting written for the orchestra that included the contrabass tuba. We have Tchaikovsky and Mahler and Stravinsky. Everybody went for it. But it took a bit of a while before we actually got a concerto for the instrument with orchestra. And it happened in the way of this man here. I'm going to show you a very interesting little picture. This is Ralph Vaughan Williams, famous British composer of the British pastoral style of music. And in 1954, he decided he'd write a concerto for the tuba. And here's the soloist on the occasion, Philip Catelet, who was playing a uh, bass tuba, not a contrabass tuba, a uh, little F, English F tuba. And this has been, since this premiere, a standard in the tuba repertoire. You see it in every tuba audition for every orchestra. People play it on recitals all the time. I've played it with orchestra. I've played it on recitals. And in our way of being musicians, we kind of do that thing, but sometimes we don't look as deeply as we should. And it wasn't until COVID time, and I had lots of time on my hands, I started going through all my music just to have something to play. And I came across the Vaughn Williams Tuba Concerto, and I'm starting to play that. And I thought, 1954, how old was Vaughn Williams? And I looked, he was 72 years old. He was the same age that I am now when he wrote this. He was a grandfather. Wow, I hadn't thought about that before. And when I think about that particular detail in relationship to the concerto, lots of things start making real sense. Now the real wonderful, we'll call it the meat and sandwich, I don't know, the middle movement of this three movement concerto is called Romanza. And it is a beautiful song without words. It reminds me, or actually I associate it with a piece that uh, Vaughn Williams wrote 30 years earlier called The Lark Ascending, one of his most famous works. It has that same kind of lift and openness and song-like quality of that British pastoral style. And so today I'd like to play the Romanza for you on a contrabass tuba, not a bass tuba, an octave higher. And because there is no orchestra here or even a piano, I'm going to take the liberty of playing this song without words an octave lower and allow the really rich chocolatey sound of the tuba express this melody, which, yes, is at the heart of our literature. And because it was written by a grandfather and because I am a grandfather, I'm dedicating this to my grandchildren who live in the UK. Amelia and Finn, and saying, this is for you guys. I'm playing this for you. Von Williams' Romanza. Mm-hmm. 
So there we have it, the tuba elucidated but not explained, a mystery, a wonder, an instrument that I love, and something that I miss and not being able to play with my associates right now, and something that I look forward passionately to being back here with audiences and the orchestra to play once again. Thank you for listening. Go well. Ho. Oh. <laughs>